All right. Uh, let's begin with a blessing. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshana B'mitzvotah V'tzivano Latzok Bedivrei Torah Blessed are you, Lord our God, the King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and commands us to engross ourselves in words of Torah. So, um, the title Leviticus for the book it's derived from the Greek Septuagint version of the Torah, and the, uh, the book of Leviticus is predominantly concerned with Levitical rituals. Uh, an older Hebrew name for the book uh, of, was the Laws of the Priesthood. But in Judaism today, it's referred to by the name of Vaikra, and which means, and he called. By cries the first Hebrew word in the book, which begins by saying, and the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from inside the tent of meeting. Now, Leviticus describes the, the sacrificial service, the, the liturgy, the duties of the priest. It also introduces what we call ritual purity. The biblical diet, you know, the kosher diet, the calendar of appointed times when we uh, get together, the Moedim, the uh, laws of holiness and the laws re relating to redemption, vows, and tithes. In addition, Leviticus uh, discourses on ethical instructions and holiness. The 24th reading from the Torah is uh, uh, it's the the Hebrew name of the book, it's the same name, and it introduces Vaikra. The, this portion introduces the sacrificial service and describes five different types of sacrifices. All right? Now, one of the things that makes Leviticus really hard to read is the incredible detail that goes into that are written into these rituals and and that are you know for us <laughs> let's face it you know the the uh, these rituals of of, of sacrifice <clears throat> they're uh, obscure at best you know even after you study them a lot you know, there's still lots of questions and you know and at worst they're just a total mystery just cryptic as all get out you know you just you look at it and Problem is, you've already fallen asleep trying to read this stuff. And uh, we may understand some of what went on at a tabernacle sacrifice with, uh, you know, you, you, it takes a lot of patience and study, okay? And uh, this morning in our Torah club, we're going to be going over it again. And I've got handouts for uh, the people. Yes, I do. And... Uh, and, but, you know, in the end, it's still something that's difficult for us to understand. Uh, for example, now I'm not, I'm not sure how many times I've heard someone say that Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to God because he brought a lamb and Cain brought produce from his fields. Well, you've got to look at this a little bit different, you know. Produce was acceptable to God in several aspects, as we can see in Leviticus, the second chapter. Uh, there were grain and bread offerings, but in some cases, a blood sacrifice was required. It was required. There are some requirements. So um, <clears throat> there you go. And so, you know, <laughs> this picture, of course, we got uh, Abel being very angelic looking and Cain being, you know, more evil. And so... Uh, yeah, why couldn't uh, why couldn't Cain give the right sacrifice? Well, because he wasn't able, I guess. And so, um, the grain offering. Let's look at the grain offering. All right, yeah, uh, I got to quit saying that joke. Okay, grain offerings are expected at two of the Moedim. The Moedim meaning the appointed times. At the feast of the first fruits, is the it was the only acceptable sacrifice. And there, there were actually several kinds of sacrifices. But one of them was the sin offering, 
which was ordinarily a blood offering, uh, but uh, a grain offering was actually acceptable for a very poor person to bring. Okay, if they could not bring a, a bull or a goat or or a, a sheep, a lamb, or even pigeons or doves, you know, and they were really, really, really poor, they could bring two quarts of flour. Okay, that's the very minimum. The details are confusing, but it's it's worth picking apart and understanding when we realize that. The, it was the most common offering of a very, very poor person. It takes on real value for, the, uh, for a significant part of the population uh, in Moses' day. They, you know, they, a lot of them were very poor people, they, and they didn't have big flocks in, in many cases. Uh, this was an offering that was made by people that could only dream of someday that they could sacrifice a lamb or a, or a, a big bull or something like that. And so, um, so once we get into this, um, you know, it's, it's still going to be a little bit foreign for us. Now, I've studied this stuff for years, I'll tell you, and I still get confused and have to go back to the scriptures. So, don't anybody ask me something, expect me to tell uh, with, with uh, you know, 100% accuracy because sometimes I'm just going to have to say, well, wait a minute, I'm having a senior moment and I can't remember exactly what goes on with that one. Let's go to the scriptures and we can do that, okay? And so I have scriptures and I even have charts that help me to, to figure this stuff out because why? we don't do sacrifices every day. You know, if we did them, it would be easier to understand. Now... Think about this. <clears throat> you have a modern education, all of you do, and you own a copy of Leviticus. I'm sure that many of you, uh, you know, ha I don't know how many Bibles each person has in this, in this congregation. I'm sure that, uh, that so some of you have <laughs> maybe dozens. I know I do. Okay? I've got uh, all sorts of uh, uh, various translations some uh, Spanish translations that I use once in a while because it, uh, it, it's, it's kind of funny, but uh, every once in a while you'll find something in the Reina Valera, the, 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 the King James Version of the, of the uh, uh, Spanish Bible, that, uh, or the King, King James equivalent, not the version, um, that you know, every once in a while you get a little bit different flavor on the word. So I use that once in a while. Got lots of Bibles. And uh, so, you know, and all of you, you have a, most of you, I think, have a regular job, unless you're retired, and then you have time for nothing. And uh, you, you know, you have an established leisure time that you can use for reading and studying, okay? You don't have to work from day, uh, day break to, to sunset every day and then flop into your bed, just bone tired, and then get up and do it the same thing the next morning. I don't think anybody's like that, do we? I mean, uh, you know, okay, some people said, yeah, they do, okay. Um, but uh, these instructions in Leviticus were written for the primary benefit of people who, what? They did not have a copy of Leviticus, okay? And uh, if they did have one, they possibly couldn't read it, and uh, then they, they lived more of a hand-to-mouth existence than maybe we do. You know, we have a lot of people, uh, and I've done it for many years, uh, live from basically paycheck to paycheck. You know, I, I, I think that's not a mystery to a lot of us, and uh, so... Uh, in other words, these original ex-slaves who were expected to live by these details, they didn't have the capacity for understanding them and remembering them that you all have because they didn't have something written down that they could go back and refer to. So they had to try to remember. These, they would have had uh, this passage read to them periodically. That's uh, what the Torah required, that... Uh, every once in a while, they would get together and they would uh, uh, have it read to them. And uh, 
uh, they probably, they had developed a better capacity for memorizing things than we do today. Because why? We don't have to. You know, we just can go on and do whatever we want to do. I mean, it just, I said, well, I'll, uh, I'll look it up, you know. And kind of like today with um, calculators, math. You know, uh, my kids were always amazed that um, they would, you know, when we're doing something and, and I would uh, do a, a calculation, a math calculation in my head, and, and you know, they're running for their, com their little calculators. And uh, I said, well, we didn't have calculators when I was your age. And they just looked at me like, what? <laughs> and so, you know, you develop some skills based on what technology you don't have. Also, you develop some skills based on the technology that you do have. And so I'm not, uh, I'm not putting down technology. It works. I mean, it's, it's great when it's working. And uh, so uh, these people could probably memorize a little bit better. And, uh, you know, you, um, and you'll see that in populations where the people don't have a great deal of literacy, meaning they can't read and write, but they can memorize things. And um, so, um, you know, they, if they needed clarification, they would have to go and ask one of the, the, the priests that lived in the various towns around uh, Israel. And, uh, um, but practicing these details, you, you go through it once or twice, and, and uh, you know, they, they would have had to make these, these offerings during the, the, uh, the festivals, the Moedim. So they would l eventually learn it. Now, here's the point. I believe that uh, this is it's a, a powerful point of the, the, what God is trying to tell us here today. Um, sacrifice is not meant to be easy. If it was easy, we wouldn't think of it as a sacrifice. And uh, one of my favorite sayings is, well, if it's easy, anyone can do it. You know, that's, uh, um, that's what I say sometimes when I can't get my lawnmower to start and I have to take it to somebody else because I do not, you know, I'm not a lawnmower starter person. And um, anyway... An Israelite who wanted to bring a sin offering had to go through some steps. Now, first, we're talking about the the the, the very poor ones. We're not going to we're not going to be doing some of the old uh, I mean the uh, the blood sacrifices right now. Let's talk about just the ones where the very poor person is putting together a bread offering, a, a meal offering. First, he had to take into account how he would bake make the bread would it be baked or fried it was to be baked did he need to, to bake it into wafers or in cakes it was if it was to be fried uh, would he fry it in a pan or on a griddle uh, these details took into account the economic position of the person bringing the sacrifice could he did he have an oven could he afford an oven you know maybe sometimes they just cooked out over an open flame Second, what kind of pans or pottery did they have? Now, clay pottery was the norm. Metal pots and pans were not very common for the ordinary folks, the, the, the working class of, of uh, Israel. The utensils the person owned dictated the procedure that he used in making his offering. It had to be done correctly. In general, the more expensive his utensils, the more liberally he had to use his oil. The most expensive metal pot required deep frying the, the offering in olive oil. If uh, he was baking it into small little wafers uh, on a vessel of pottery, he could simply and conservatively spread a little oil over them, uh, kind of the way that we would use butter, okay? And uh, the method was important even for the poorest of the poor. A sacrifice was not just about the expense of the offering. 
it was the amount of tension, attention that was given to it. Now, number three, did he have the right kind of ingredients? You had to use what they call fine flour, okay? Now, this was not ordinary flour used for their daily bread, you know, because they could grind the stuff around, and, but it had to be uh, ground much finer. Uh, it had to be ground to a very fine powder. Salt was to be mixed into the batter of his cakes and wafers. A little extra oil and some frankincense was not to be mixed in, but it would be brought to the priest on top of the offering because it was to be completely burnt and not eaten by the priest, okay? You didn't want to try to eat frankincense, okay? It smells great, but it doesn't taste so good. All right. Um, frankincense was an expensive resinous tree sap that was used as a perfume. It wasn't something that, uh, that uh, poor people had just lying about. Frankincense was also not something that was eaten. Um, it was a fragrant, what, what do they call it? A fragrant aromatic oil, much like we would use, you know, the some of these aromatic oils, or what do, they, what do they call them, essential oils, you know, that uh, people make up and say, oh, yeah, you're supposed to drink this stuff. And, whoa, you know. Um, what, uh, what's the stuff that they call thieves uh, something? You know, are you, are you familiar with the essential oil? It's called, some of you know, you know, thieves oil. Well, something that's got, uh, it, anyway, it's stuff that they used to, uh, um, that they used back during the uh, plagues in Europe that, uh, you know, it was, it was supposed to give them uh, immunity from the plague and, and so on and so forth. And so people talk about that stuff being a real good natural medicine for you. Well, okay, um, it tastes nasty. All right. Details are important. Okay, I'm waiting. You get it. It looks like a duck, walks like a duck, but doesn't talk like a duck. You better wait. And so there you go. The lucky duck never realizes the intended benefits of learning a foreign language. Now you get it? Okay. So, pay attention. Details are important. All right. So, here is what you could not do. You couldn't just grab some leftover hot dogs and bring them along to the tabernacle. You couldn't just drop by H-E-B and buy a loaf of Wonder Bread while you were out shopping. You couldn't just bake any loaf you liked and expect it to be acceptable. You couldn't use any old recipe or leave out the seasonings. So, um, this is just really great. You know what? That's all right. My, uh, my notes just went from slide 15 to slide 23. It's all right. First fruits, you give the best, okay? That's the best. You, you have to give the best. All right, give me that next slide. What does that next slide say? All right. God has a plan for you, okay? Now, did you know that God has a plan for you? <laughs> Oh, bless your heart. Okay, now we'll now maybe I can. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it, it wasn't all that bad. Okay, yeah. All right, now you do have to plan. God has a plan for you, and so you had to have a plan for doing all the sacrifices. You had to be careful not to slip into uh, autopilot and make the bread the way you always did. I don't know if any of you ever go into autopilot, um, but uh, uh, sometimes when I'm driving, you know, this morning I was supposed to stop off at the, at the Walmart in Columbus, but just about the time that I was going to, you know, do that, 
Some guy came up on my right-hand side going over 100 miles an hour, literally. I mean, he just, I was, I, you know, I was not letting the grass grow under my feet, but, uh, I mean, he went around me like uh, just blew my doors off. And I was watching him cutting in and out of traffic, and I missed my exit to go to Columbus, you know. And, and so then we, uh, we ended up uh, getting the supplies that we needed for the kids to stuff uh, this morning at Sealy's. But, you know, sometimes you just get on, on autopilot on the interstate, and you just drive right by your exit. I don't know how many times I've done that. Um, you have to have, you need to associate the right details with the right recipe. You know, if, if you're doing a recipe, um, can't be that all the time already. Goodness sakes. Uh, you know, the recipe is important and you don't, uh, you don't use, uh, you know, 450 degrees for an hour for a, to bake a cake. No, you don't do that not, uh, and not call it cake. You know, you can maybe call it charcoal, br briquettes, you know, and you had, to, uh, you had to arrange things so that th this bread could be brought to the priest. Only then would the sacrifice be acceptable. So, in other words, the event of the sacrifice standing before the priest near the altar at the tabernacle was not only it was not the only important part of uh, the sacrifice. You had to sacrifice other things, too. Now, we've got a checklist. You had to sacrifice some money because it took money to buy some of this stuff. You had to sacrifice some time because why? Okay, it took time to bake the cake, especially the way they did it back in those days. Uh, and you had to take a great deal of care with this. You know, you couldn't just... Um, throw anything together. You had to have some skills. Now, um, either the person that's offering it or maybe somebody in his household had the skills. I'm not going to say that every man was going to be able to go out there and cook up something, but, you know, you never know. I mean, there's some guys that are pretty good, uh, pretty good cooks, and they can do that, but you had to have some cooking skill, baking skill, you had to have, there were some valuable ingredients that would, uh, that would go along with that. Uh, like I said, the, the frankincense would be valuable and the salt. And you had to d pay attention. You pay attention. Now, this, uh, this applied to everyone. The rules were different for different kinds of sacrifice. But even if you were destitute, you had to give appropriate care to your sacrifice. Now, why is this important to us? Well, sometimes we glibly think that uh, uh, think of the several hours we spend at the synagogue every week as a sacrifice. Now, I don't know if any of you think that coming here on Saturday on Shabbat is a sacrifice, but maybe so. We sometimes think uh, uh, of the hand-me-downs. We, uh, we donate to what? A goodwill or Salvation Army as a sacrifice. Um, we sometimes think of the relatively minor simplicity with which we uh, conduct our lives as a sacrifice. You know, we don't go off and do goofy, silly stuff or... Uh, take extravagant vacations and, and uh, you know, and so you could call that a sacrifice. But are they really sacrifices? Do they cost us anything at all? Do they require care or attention? Do we really miss the time of the, or the materials that go into our so-called sacrifices? For the Israelites, a sacrifice was not uh, appropriately offered unless time care, money, and attention were also sacrificed before approaching the altar. And I'm again reminded, we talked about this story a couple of weeks ago, the story of David in First Chronicles 21, who uh, he needed to offer a sacrifice. Why? Because he had sinned and God was punishing Israel because of that sin. And he says, okay, you offer a sacrifice and I'll stop the, uh, the plague. And so... Um, he was under God's judgment. He wanted to bring an end to it. He decided that the sacrifice was the way to go, and he found the most appropriate site, and he approached the owner. Now, I'm going to read the, um, uh, 
read this just so we can, uh, I don't get it messed up. First, uh, First Chronicles 21, 22 to 24. Then David said to Ornan, Give me the site of this threshing floor that I may build an altar to Adonai. Sell it to me for full price so that the plague on my people may be stopped. Then uh, Ornan said to David, Take it. Let my Lord the king do whatever seems good in his eyes. Look, I will give you, I will even give you the oxen for burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give this. And David said, Nope. I insist on buying it for the full price, for I will not take for Adonai what is yours or a burnt offering that costs me nothing. Now, David understood the personal cost of sacrifice. Even as the king who would take what he wanted, you know, and that kings back in those days did. Shoot, we have presidents today that do that. And was re- he was respected enough then, you know, to um, this guy, in David's case, the guy says, sure, you can have it. Let me, let me just give it to you. And no, he was going to keep this personal between him and God. He wanted to pay for it. So um, unlike David, though, the sacrifice for our sins have already been paid. We, uh, we no longer sacrifice on altars. Yeshua paid the price for our sin. That sacrifice is the most important, the most overreaching and significant sacrifice of all time. It applies even to us now, 2,000 years later. Our sins are washed away by the simple acceptance of Yeshua, who paid the price for us on the cross. Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, He understood sacrifice. He knew how important it was. He offered sacrifices at the temple even after his Damascus Road experience. Okay, I've heard people say that, you know, they talk about uh, his, his Damascus Road experience where, you know, he saw the light and was knocked off his horse and, and, uh, um, you know, that, that when, when Paul, uh, when Saul became a Christian, and turned and changed his name to Paul, okay? Well, let me clue you in here, get the theology straight. Paul, Saul, his, his, his uh, Jewish name was uh, Shaul, okay? He never changed that when he was around his, his family, his folks. He was still Shaul. And when he was uh, dealing with Greeks, Romans, and, uh, and that, he was Paul. And so, and guess what? He never became a Christian, all right? He was uh, knocked off his high horse, and he learned that uh, uh, Yeshua was the Messiah, but he kept on doing sacrifices. He kept on uh, keeping all of the Jewish laws that were there, and uh, he just never gave up being a Jew. He was paid for the sacrifices for a group of men who were completing their Nazarite vows. And he also understood personal sacrifice. And many of you know that uh, one of my favorite scriptures, and I, and I use it, you, you know, you could probably quote it for me, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, um, many, many preachers and teachers seem to always focus Personal sacrifice on sacrificial giving. You know, that, that's uh, the way they do it. Oh, it's the sacrifice. You know, that means giving, giving, giving. In. Certainly, giving of tithes and offerings are important. But look at Paul. what Paul said. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That is so much more important than how much you give in, put in, in putting in a little green box back there. Okay. 
you know, uh, all of you know that have been here a while, I don't really do uh, a lot of teaching or preaching on, on uh, tithing and offerings and uh, you know, the Lord is, is blessing. We get by and uh, we're not in a big fancy building yet, but uh, you know, when one of you guys, uh, your, your ship comes in, you want to donate it three or four million dollars, uh, we'll build a new building, okay, just for ourselves. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't get into that too much. Um, that uh, living, you know, giving your, your body a living sacrifice, that's so much more important. Um, it's laying your life on the altar daily. You know, being an Isaac, being willing to lay down your, your life on that altar. Um, you don't have any lapses for vacation. Uh, no changes from behavior from... Uh, um, you know, after after Shabbat is over, so you start on Sunday morning, and uh, you know, okay, I'm gonna, you know, a different person than you were on Shabbat. You should be the same guy all the way along. Okay, we re- remain that same person that went to services on Shabbat. Remain that same person all week long. The prophet Samuel had the pulse of God when he said in First Samuel that. To obey is better than sacrifice. Now, the Lord would rather uh, each of us follow his commandments than to have to ask forgiveness for violating them. Um, Think of it this way. Would you rather your spouse uphold uh, your marriage vows instead of having to uh, get forgiven for cheating? I think that's that's a no-brainer. That's a silly question, and of course, it's better to keep up with your marriage vows. Wouldn't you rather your children obeyed and did what they were supposed to rather than have to discipline them and and so forth? Yes, and that's why it's important for each of us to be forward-thinking, plan ahead, think about what uh, we should be doing to stay in the center of God's will and purpose for our lives. I would invite you this morning to examine yourself and your, and your particular situation. You can't make changes in your life without a plan. You know, if uh, you don't have a plan, what, what is it? The five Ps, proper planning prevents poor performance. Well, we're not going to go that, okay? Proper planning prevents poor performance performance okay and if you were in the military you know there was another p in there okay that's okay uh if you don't plan then you're planning to fail is living for god a sacrifice i would say yes it is in the short term and our lives actually are a short term you know i mean we are just what did uh, solomon say we're just like grass that grows up one day and then's gone the next so yeah we're like that um but we have to give up momentary pleasure for what? Eternal treasure. Give up momentary pleasure for eternal treasure. So, what would you give up for a closer walk with the Lord? Perhaps it's a bad habit or an addiction or just overindulgence. Um, it may be something that's necessary to life, but uh, you know, be able to be curbed. You know, you you just. Control it. Perhaps uh, it's a luxurious and physical pleasure. Who knows? But what about sacrificing our time to commit to him with daily consistency? In the sense that fasting is a symbol of a larger self-denial, it's sound exercise for us to fast for you know, some specific and noticeable capacity and, you know, that sacrifice, that fasting is a sacrifice, okay? It really is, especially for me. You know, I hate to do fasting, you know? I'm more of a feasting guy than a fasting guy, you know? And you can tell. Um, but uh, sometimes fasting is what it takes. The truth that we receive from Leviticus 2 and the excruciating detail of the sacrifice, uh, sacrificial offerings of the Israelites uh, is what we must give. Uh, you know, we have to give it some attention. It's not only the sacrifice of Yeshua on the cross that has significance, 
or even our acceptance of that sacrifice, though they are vital and even of primary importance. The smaller everyday sacrifices w that we can make, even in, you know, some of us with, the, you know, you don't have a whole lot of money, you can still make these sacrifices. They are gifts to God. And as such, they deserve our undivided attention and care. You have to plan You just you know, to, to uh, serve the Lord. It's not something that you do haphazardly. You have to plan your life, plan what you're doing to uh, sacrifice to the Lord. And that's what we learn from Leviticus, the second chapter. And uh, the, all of those those sacrifices there that, that are in there that you don't understand, that you fall asleep while you're trying to read them, there was a purpose for that, okay? And uh, that's what I wanted to bring to you this morning, the idea of planning ahead. And if we had more time, I'd even go into personal planning ahead for, you know, all sorts of other things too, uh, prepping uh, for, you know, we live in the Gulf Coast, folks. You better have all of the stuff that you need for hurricanes and all that kind of stuff. Have it in your, in, you know, being able to, to, to live a couple of weeks, you know, without electricity, that sort of thing. You know, if, if you live on the Gulf Coast, you need to plan for that. And it takes a little planning, and uh, that's, a, that's a personal thing, and we're, I'm not going to get more into it because we're out of time. But anyway... Plan ahead and plan and do things properly for the Lord. Could we stand and we'll close in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for your blessings. We uh, thank you that uh, for everyone that's here today. Give each and every one of us, Lord, the, the uh, capacity to plan ahead for what we're going to do for you, that, uh, that our... Our giving to you, our sacrificing to you is not haphazard, just off the cuff and you know, meaningless, but it is for a specific purpose. And if it is sacrificial, that beyond our means, Lord, help us to manage that. We pray that you would just be with us this morning as we learn how to plan for a sacrificial giving in life with, with you.